probably need some of the mod monitoring that they just had to try and reset. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're on the record on State versus Zimmerman, case number 12, CF 10A3A. Attorneys, please make your appearances for the record. Bernie Delarion on behalf of the State of Florida. John Brown on behalf of the State of Florida. Mark O'Mara on behalf of Mr. Zimmerman. John West here with Mr. Zimmerman to my left. Yvonne Hewitt on behalf of the State of Miami. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Scott Ponce on behalf of the media organizations listed in our papers. And Greg Thomas on behalf of the Orlando Sentinel and the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before we get started today, I wanted to uh, uh, provide to counsel for the state and counsel for the defense the um, order disclosing the redacted medical records. Uh, this is the original. Um, this one is for the state, this one is for the defense. Um, I have reviewed them. Uh, what I have done and provided to um, the state um, along with the order and the defense along with the order, instead of making a list of what is redacted and what isn't redacted, I've copied every record and the portions that are redacted are not in there, but it will have the date um, of whatever the visit may have been. Uh, so those are in the um, envelopes that I uh, are attached to the order and the envelope, your envelopes are not sealed, but the original unredacted and the redacted ones are put in the court file under seal. So I'm clear that you've now given the state a copy which, from which you've redacted certain items? Yes, I've okay. given, it, it's, it's every page that has been provided to the court. Some of the pages just have the heading of the Altamont family practice with the date or, you know, the, the right. heading part and whatever the court um, deemed um, not relevant or that should be redacted has been redacted. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, we're here today, there are three um, motions that were set for hearing, and um, I don't know what order you want to go in, I was just going to go by the notice of hearing. Um, the first one was the uh, defendant's demands for specific discovery. Yes, Your Honor, and as to that motion, we had um, filed a motion, or a specific demand for discovery. Paul, last time I had told you that it wasn't ripe. In the intervening time, I'd asked Mr. Deliranda on behalf of the state to uh, respond to me. I haven't gotten a specific response from the state yet, but my request to the court is quite straightforward. I've read your motion. I've read your memo of law. I've read the cases that you have provided. I, if you have additional argument, um, no? I, I really think it's everything that is in there. Just simply that I think, to, to summarize real quickly, the state has an obligation to get us what we call Brady or information suggesting that it's exculpatory. Under the case law that I've cited, that umbrella goes out to other law enforcement agencies, including federal law enforcement agencies. That would include the FBI and Department of Justice and FDLE. I can present you evidence to support on my position that I want everything from FDLE pursuant to your court order because we know from the depositions we've taken, we haven't gotten it all. So I just want something very specific so that I know FDLE is giving us everything attached to the Zimmerman case. Okay, Mr. De La Ronda, if you would like to, oh, Mr. Guy, are you gonna respond? Just briefly, Your Honor. Judge, if we can begin with the proposition that the defense is not entitled to every shred of evidence in possession of the state, what they've asked for in this specific demand is every conceivable shred or electronic piece of data to DOJ, the FBI, and FDLE. And to date, the state has supplied every report that it is aware of from FDLE, Department of Justice, and the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Additionally, we have provided the statement of every witness that has been taken by a member of those agencies. So I submit to date, the state has complied with its obligation under the Florida Rules of Discovery and we understand it's a continuing obligation, and we will abide by that accordingly. Okay. Um, rule 3.220 is the discovery rule here in the state of Florida, and counsel, um, I know, are all aware of the rule, as is the, the court. Um, subsection A binds the prosecutor and the defense to all the discovery procedures that are set forth therein. Um, subsection B uh, sets forth the prosecutor's obligation to disclose material within their possession or the control. Case law um, includes... Um, the, um, the, any material, uh, even if party to any compact or agreement with the FBI or any federal agencies. And in support, um, 
um, of that proposition, I would cite the State versus Coney at 294 Southern 2nd 82, Florida uh, Supreme Court 1973, Yaneta, Y-A-N-E-T-T-A -T -T -A versus State, found at 320 Southern 2nd 23, 3rd DCA 1975, and State versus Miranda, 777 Southern 2nd 1173, also a 3rd DCA 2001. So it seems that the uh, state's response is that they have provided everything there is and they understand that they're on a continuing obligation. So and unless and until there's specific things that need to be addressed, I mean, just thinking there's something else out there, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna Here, go look at the file. I, I understand the court's ruling, so I shouldn't be arguing, but here's the, when the state, well, it's not necessarily but, a, a ruling. I mean, the state has responded. But, they've provided everything. So. I, but we have evidence that that is not true in the past. So here's what, here's what I hear from what you're saying and from what the state is saying. If we can find out what it is that we don't have, then we can come to you and demand them to give it to us. I'll give you some examples of what they've given us that is inaccurate. Well. So I can't, here's my problem. What you're asking me to do is to take on the state's burden. When we look at Brady, we look at the case of Osiris, what it says is they have the affirmative obligation to go get it. So with the FBI is a perfect example. They, it's a law enforcement agency, it's covered by the case law, and what they're saying is the only thing that we have is 54 pages from the FBI and we're giving you that. What I would ask that you do and what you demand in the case law is just say to them that they have contacted F FBI I think and that's what Mr. No, no, no. Guy just, don't, don't, no, no, I'm no, sorry. no, please. Um, I think Mr. Guy just said that he has given everything. I, you know, you're, you're asking me to, to almost, for me to prove a negative. I, I can't. Um, you have, you have means to, to take depositions or, or whatever means are available to see if there is any other information. All of you are officers of the court. And I have an officer of the court standing up at the podium on the record telling me that they have provided everything that they know is out there. What he said was he provided everything they gave him. <laughs> he did not say that they've had the affirmative, taken on the affirmative obligation of talking to the FBI and saying, what else do you have? And the case law specifically says they have that obligation. They're aware of this case law and, they're, and I'm aware of their obligation. I'm, I'm assuming because he told me he knows he has an obligation for continuing discovery uh, to supply any discovery that they're aware of, um, it's a continuing obligation that as an officer of the court, I am expecting him to abide by that. Well, then. So uh, it's almost like you're putting the cart before the horse. You're saying that there should, there, uh, I'm, I'm so sure I'm, you know, I suppose there's more information out there and I have somebody telling me that there is not. Um, so. So there's nowhere to go until that comes an issue. So then I ask for this. If it now comes back on our shoulders to go find out what the FBI has in addition to the 54 pages that they've given to the state and you're saying the state has no affirmative obligation to go to their other law enforcement officer and say. I did not say any such thing. But they, then let's have them say that they've done that because I don't think that they've done because I think they're sticking their head in the sand about additional information because everything that seems to come out seems to be exculpatory so they're not looking for it. So the FBI. Who yes, is well, you're making statements that I don't know are true. Mr. Guy, do you know if there's anything else out there? Have you asked them? Uh, Mr. Deliana has spoken with those agencies and again, to our knowledge, there are no reports yet furnished by the FBI or DOJ. And, and we have turned over the reports uh, so far furnished by FBI. And, and again, as the court mentioned, it is a continuing obligation and we will continue to uh, contact those agencies and see if any reports or any other interviews become uh, uh, available. This, this, this court, what I'm trying to say, Mr. O'Mara, is that all the lawyers know what their discovery obligations are. If this court goes to trial and something else comes out, the state runs the risk of the, if there's a guilty verdict, they run the risk of that being set aside or reversed in a new trial order based upon some information that they failed or refused to give. They're aware of that. The case law that you provided is very clear on that issue. So, you know, I, I, I have the representation from an officer of the court. I also asked in my specific motion that we get native files and electronic discovery from FDLE. Uh, we have to avoid, and I would like to show this to the court if I might.
and I'm, I'm going to make that a composite exhibit so that you get the feel for what it is that we get as information concerning my client. Let me interrupt you for just one second. Sarah, if you will make this, um, any objections to this being introduced? No, no. This will come in as defense exhibit one to the uh, defense demand for specific um, discovery. And I would like to add this, since it's a composite, these are other ones to that composite. Any objections? Yes, you may. And then, Your Honor, this would be my second composite, which is the second round of information that we've gotten, which goes from... Okay, just let me take this step by step. Any objections to these documents being added to composite one? No. All right, thank you. Um, any objections to the um, defense composite exhibit that they're seeking to introduce as number two? No. They will come in as composite exhibit number two. Thank you. Those are sheets. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Continue. Now, the first one is what they gave us under the guise that they're giving us all the discovery that they have. And they would come in to you and say, well, we gave them everything. And that was the first composite. Then we said, what are these? They look like abstract paintings because, as you can see, you can't tell anything of what they are. So then we said, will you please give us the native files? Give us the actual digital photographs because we all know we deal in digital photographs. Then we got composite two, which are not digital photographs. They are now color copies of what they gave us in one. Evidently, of course, they had color copies to begin with, but they decided to give us, as the defense, the black and white. Let me interrupt right there. Do you have the, the zip or whatever electronic means it was that you printed out those photos from? Your Honor, may I respond to this since I'm the one that dealt with this? May I respond yes. to the Florida? I provided what they gave me first, which was uh, black and white. Then they wanted color, but make sure the record is clear. All this evidence was provided to the defense. They physically went to the FDLE. I arranged a meeting. They went over there and met with the FDLE agents. And we arranged for all the evidence to be open. And they had a camera. They took photographs of all this evidence. And then they said, we want color. So then I went back and asked them. And I have provided not a color photograph, but the actual disc that FDLE gave us of those items those photographs that the agent himself took, the analyst. So you're saying you provided them That with is this. correct. Did you not get third it? Third time. My concern is not what they finally did on the third time on this particular one. My concern is that there is additional evidence that we've been trying to get from FDLE today. We were here before. You're, you're standing here arguing about something now that you've got. I, I and, have to, uh, sorry. And if, if you have it, then that is no longer an issue. What you're, what you're now seeking is anything that you don't know of, they don't know of, that may be out there. This is what I want. I want the entirety of the FDLE file. Agent Lee seems to be the chief agent in charge. I want FDLE through the state you attorney's office. FDLE? We went to FDLE and took our own pictures. And at FDLE meeting, that's when we found out about Trayvon Martin's phone that we had never known I about need before. I hear all that, yeah, but, but did you go to FDLE? Yes, I did. Okay. They did not give me digital files. Did they open it all up for you? No, just the evidence, not the files, just the evidence, just pieces of evidence that we looked at. They did not give up. I, I understand that I'm, no, uh, uh, let me I take want, a second. I, I want to get down I to am, what you do and do not, were okay. not provided. So. Here, here's my concern. And I have to give you some history because it evidences where I am. Short history. We go in there to talk to, uh, take a deposition of the person. I don't, I, I, and I don't mean to keep interrupting you, and I really apologize for that, but I do want to take control over my, my hearings yes, and um, when if, if, you, if you're saying that you hadn't gotten something and then you finally got it I really don't need to know about that unless you're seeking some other remedy but so I just want to know what it is that you think okay. you don't have that has not been provided to you and now we're talking about FDLE okay. and you said that you went there mm -hmm. and while you were there did they open up their files to you no Okay. No, what, what we're talking about is a, is a tangible evidence review. So the phone and the, the tangible evidence had nothing to do with their file. What we found out, the deposition is not going too far into it, is that we did not have everything that FDLE has. So all I'm trying to do now is a very simple process. If you were to enter an order that says FDLE is hereby ordered to ship over to O'Mara all of their digital files, everything they have. Now, some of that will be duplicated because they have given us some. But under that order, I will now know that I have everything FDLE has 
in this case regarding my client. And that's what I deserve. Well, let's talk about that because 3.220 says that the state is supposed to provide you the right to list what they know is available or the means to copy, inspect. It doesn't mean that they have to copy, inspect. They have to provide the defense the opportunity to go there and look at everything that they want that's in that file and ask for what they want a copy of. Because there may be thousands of things in a room, and if you only want a copy of one, why should they copy thousands of things? So you're allowed to go back to FDLE, and if you want that in a court order, that's fine. You can go back to FDLE and inspect their entire file on this matter and ask them to provide you with copies of whatever you are seeking to have copies of. Agreed. And what I'm asking for is electronic copies, which is not thousands of- Whatever's in their file. Right. So I want the order to say, if it might, that I want to receive all of the FDLE discovery in what we call native file, which is digital, so that it's not thousands of pages. I will get all their reports the way they generate them, because they generate them not on typewriters anymore. I understand. I understand. So that's what I want. Well, if you will give me a proposed order, send a copy of it to Mr. De La Ronda. If there's no objection to the form of the order, I will sign it as is. If there is an objection, I'll recraft it. Now, as to Department of Justice, we've received nothing. So is it the state's position that they have contacted DOJ and there is nothing? Was it either you, Mr. De La Ronda, or Mr. Guy, who talked to DOJ? I will defer to Mr. De La Ronda. Your Honor, I guess it's obvious that the defense is aware. The FBI has been doing an investigation separate from this case, and that is their investigation. We can't get involved in that. In other words, that deals with security matters, not just regarding this specific case, but also other matters in terms of this community. And so I don't think this is our obligation to check with them when they're saying it's an ongoing investigation. Now, I have gotten, I've contacted the FBI. I've gotten all the FBI reports regarding witnesses' interviews, and I've provided them. I am still constantly checking. So if there's something that I've, you know, gone through, I'm trying to get them. But I've provided those, including evidence that wasn't favorable to the state, where they interviewed an associate of the defendant who said he's not a racist, or et cetera. I've provided all those under my obligation, and I contacted them. I will continue to contact them. But they, from what I understand, they have an ongoing. I don't want to know what kind of investigation they've done, because, quite frankly, that's not regarding this specific case. Well, who's making that determination? The FBI, in terms of, they can subpoena, they can ask the FBI. They have the authority to go subpoena them. They can request that from the FBI, and then the FBI gets to respond to that. It's not my obligation to go and get that from the FBI if it's an ongoing investigation. In terms of whether it's civil rights or not, or whether there was a police department investigation, I think that's what Mr. O'Meara is trying to get at. The case law says, basically, that, you know, the defense would have to exhaust all means available to get the additional information that they think exists and has not been produced. So that's what I meant by maybe we're taking the cart before the horse. Have you inquired by subpoena or otherwise of the FBI or Department of Justice right now? The answer is no, and I believe the reason why is because I do think that the state, and I think the case law supports it. I think you referenced it partially, but we can focus on some of the cases that say. I've read every single one of the cases. I've highlighted them. I spent the entire night last night doing that. Am I wrong? I am aware of it. But even in the State v. Miranda case, in that case, the Third District Court of Appeals said, where it was undisputed that the state made efforts to obtain, and this was not a case that you had provided, where it was undisputed that the state made efforts to obtain information not in its actual possession, which the trial court order produced. They went on to say, defendant made no attempt to subpoena the federal agencies. The court said, Third District Court of Appeals said it was confronted with a situation in which the state has made its best efforts to obtain the information and documents and did not allege there was any compact or agreement between the state and the federal agencies named in the trial court order, which would enhance the ability of the state to obtain the requested documents to no avail. The court, Third District Court of Appeals, quashed the trial court's order excluding a confidential informant as a state witness and also quashed the order granting the motion to compel. So that seems to be, you know, the latest. Leaving relevant evidence to repose in the hands of another agency 
maybe it's the FBI, while utilizing his access to it in preparing the case for trial. What Martinez says, I think, is they do have an affirmative obligation to go get it. You know as well as I do that there's two people who can call up the FBI and get the information. Them and somebody else besides me. Because they won't give it to me, but they will give it to them if you tell them they have to go get it. Now, he sort of said two things. He stood up and said, I don't know that it's my responsibility to go get it, but he said, if they give it to me, I'll forward it. All I'm saying is, look at Martinez and says, look, the F here's the reality. The FBI has been involved in this case for four and a half months. I know that they talked to some 30 witnesses because they did give me 54 pages, but I don't have an agent report. I don't have a tasking sheet. I don't have anything that I know that the FBI has done only because of 30 years' experience. Here's what I'm going to rule on that issue with the FBI. If you provide the state with a list of the things that you think the FBI has done, Mr. De La Ronda will then call the FBI and ask them, do you have this information? And if you do, provide it, and he will pass it on to you. That's the best Thank that you, I Your can Honor. do about that. That is the perfect first okay. step. If you will take, put that in the proposed order, and that would also go for the DOJ. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, yeah. so have we completed that issue? Did we make a decision on, on I'm sorry? No, go ahead. FDLE, and, and I'm getting, I'm going to give you an well, order FDLE that says. FDLE is in the states, you know, the state really can produce anything FDLE has, but I said you, you're free to go to FDLE again. Right. And review anything that they have in their files and ask them to produce whatever it is in there that you want. And I asked you to expand that to include all digital and native files and like an order saying Anything that they should do that. Anything in their entire file. Now, we all know they're not required to create something for no, you. Just what they already have. But if they have something in their file, whether it be a, a, a disk, if, they're, if they have a, a report, if they have anything in writings or electronic, and you're able to view it and you want a copy of it, they have to provide you at the same means they have it. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. That takes care of that one. The next one that you had mentioned, um, second order, was um, the defense motion for protective order regarding sequestration. Um, Mr. Um, Flood is not available to appear, but he asked that I call him on the phone. So let me go ahead and do that right now. Probably didn't want that played in open court. Let's take on the next one then and come yes, back to yes, that one. Okay. Hang on. Or press one for more. Okay. The, the next one regards, um, there are two of them that are kind of intertwined, and, and we have this the defense demand for specific discovery regarding the state's motion for gag order. Has that been provided so we can argue this? Um, well, uh, yesterday at in the last couple hours of yesterday, I got their response, which seemed to have in it a dozen or so examples of media presence by me. So I consider that to be uh, an answer to my request. Okay. Um, we also have representatives from the media who have moved to intervene in the state's um, second request for a gag order. I will grant their motions to intervene so they may argue along with everybody else. Um, Mr. De La Ronda, you go first. Court. Mr. Romero. I think this is yours, isn't it? Oh, sorry. Thanks. That's all right. Freedom of the press. We firmly believe in it too, Your Honor. Uh, it's ironic that one of the first things I do every morning when I wake up is walk outside and go to my driveway to get a newspaper, which I read every morning because I still am old-fashioned. I like the actually printed version. I don't like just the digital. And I say that because in filing this motion, somehow um, 
the defense is implying that, you know, we don't believe in freedom of the press or that we don't believe in the right of the media to partake and to uh, sit through a trial or sit through any proceeding and make comment on it. And, and I guess my, the gist of my motion, Your Honor, is not directed to the media, but to a defense counsel. And as I articulated in the motion uh, for the gag order and in the supplemental uh, memorandum, and I think the court has had an opportunity, hopefully, to review that. I have read your motion. I've met, read your memo. I've read the defense's response, their memo. I've read the um, responses from the media. Everything that has been provided as of the latest was maybe 9 o'clock this morning, I have read. Okay. I just wanted to highlight a few things, if I could, and I don't want to belabor the point because the court has uh, the motions and memorandum before the court. But I wanted to highlight a few things because I guess there's a difference of opinion in between the state and defense as to what is meant by commenting about the evidence. As I take the defense argument is that they're allowed to comment about the evidence. Our position, and maybe it's the wrong one, is that neither party should be commenting about the evidence in terms of impacting future jurors. Because if not, what's the point? Why do we, why do we go to the trouble of picking a jury and hoping that they are not bombarded with media, which they are, and which the media has the right to do in terms of uh, report what's going on, but not to be influenced by biased comments by attorneys. Because if not, what's the point? Then we would just argue in, in, in a public square as opposed to the courtroom. Why do we have a rule of law? Why do we have a courtroom other than to guarantee that the truth comes out in an adversarial proceeding where both sides have an opportunity to examine witnesses and make arguments in relation to what is produced, as opposed to going to the media and trying to, in some way, bias or prejudice potential jurors. And that's my concern here. Are we going to be able to pick a jury in Seminole County or anywhere in the state of Florida? And, and that's my concern. Now, I filed a motion uh, for a gag order Quite frankly, almost within days of us being appointed in the case, because I saw where this was going. I've had these type of cases before, and quite frankly, a lot of times the defense files these motions. And so what we're left with is we were appointed on March 22nd. That is the state attorney's office in, in the Fourth Judicial Circuit. And uh, the defendant was charged officially on April the 11th to, uh, of this year. We filed a motion. Our first motion was on April the 26th. So that is 15 days after... We were appointed in this case, when we saw what was going on, I made a decision to file a gag order, motion for gag order. That was heard in front of Judge Lester, and he denied it. He said, as quite frankly a lot of judges do, both sides are aware of what's going on in terms of what the law is. Both sides are aware of the ethical responsibilities in terms of Florida Bar Rule 4.4-3.6 regarding trial publicity. And I guess that's where we're at, because from the state's perspective, since that first gag order motion was filed, the state feels that there is still a continuing process both by the GC legal, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and other means, and then also by actually pub publicly speaking to the media, nationally, locally, in terms of commenting about facts of the case and evidence. Uh, commenting about the credibility of witnesses. I mean, why do we even have uh, an ethical rule regarding that? If we're all just going to be allowed to comment about that, then we'll have a press conference, the state will have a press conference every day and say, we don't believe this witness, we believe this witness. This witness is a liar, this witness is not. What's the point? What's the point of having a trial? And so from the state's perspective, um, we feel that there needs to be some way, the, the, jury, the court should fashion some kind of order to deal with this problem. This is a unique circumstance, and I commend Mr. Romero and the defense team in the sense that this is groundbreaking in terms of uh, GZ Legal and um, Twitter and Facebook. I know they had Facebook only for a small period of time, and then they took it down. And so, and, and I commend them in the sense that they're, they're trying something new. I don't know that it's been done anywhere else. I, I imagine it has, but, uh, you know, that's creative on the part of defense. And they are trying to put their pleadings. Now, GC Legal goes beyond that, and it starts giving opinions about what was said in the courtroom. And they start also start commenting about witnesses. 
And I, I just want to cite some examples. I did in, 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 the, in the motion, but uh, let me backtrack if I could and just slow down and cover. I wanted to break this, I guess, my motion in different parts. One is defense counsel created a website, GC Legal, dedicated to this case. They created a f Facebook website dedicated to this case, and they created a Twitter dedicated to this case. And I believe they've even got one more. Now, I'm just talking about defense counsel. I'm not talking about the defendant. I am not asking the court to prevent the defendant from speaking because, quite frankly, as I mentioned in my motion, the times he has spoken in public when he was interviewed by Sean Hannity, that was a godsend to the state. That, that was good for the state. So we don't have any objection. If he wants to keep talking to the media and he's interviewed, more power to him. I don't know that the court could honestly prohibit a defendant from speaking, but I think the court has the ability to muscle both sides, that is the state. I'm not asking that the defense only be, I'm asking that both sides, and I'm even taking the position that you should muscle also the, the, in terms of prevent the uh, police from talking about this. I'm not just asking in terms of favorable to the state, in terms of preventing the defense counsel from talking to the media. Well, what, is, what has happened as a result of this media in terms of the GC legal? And I want to address these in, in parts if I could. One is the, the social media, I guess we call it. And I don't know if it's website or whatever we call it, but I hope the court understands what I'm talking about because I'm new to this, quite frankly. I'm old and, and you know, I still, now my kids are educating me as to all this stuff. But the state's position is that what is occurring here is really the attempt by the defense to bypass Orlando Sentinel, Miami Herald, uh, all the local TV stations. Because in effect, that's what they're doing. You know, I think most reporters out there, and I, all I can say is the ones that I've experienced here, try to be objective. They try to present both sides of the story. They try to present both sides. Uh, quite frankly, from the state, they usually get a no comment or they can't even get us. But they, they attempt to be fair in terms of their interviews and um, reporting as to what occurs in the courtroom or outside the courtroom. This legal uh, website goes beyond that in that it is a biased, it gives biased opinions about certain things. So the defense counsel just, just doesn't post pleadings and court proceedings but goes beyond that and engages and encourages discussions by John Q. Citizen. So what is going to happen in, in jury selection? We're going to probably have to spend, I would submit, maybe not, I hope not, two, three weeks asking all the jurors, what websites do you go to? Have you visited that website? What commentary have you made? Now the defense gets all that commentary from people out there, and then they publish whatever they want, and whatever they don't, don't want, they don't publish. Is the defense going to then be obligated to tell the state and the court if jurors appear, whether they actually contacted them? That's an issue we haven't addressed. That, that's an issue that may arise as a result of this. But my point is, why was this website created? And I think it's important to distinguish between the websites and, and commentary by either defense counsel to the media in terms of giving an interview. So if I could, why was the website created? One could argue it was created to get funds for the defendant. That's, you know, they have the right to do that. I don't know if they do or not, but I'm not, I'm not objecting to that. Was it done to influence public opinion? I would submit that's the real reason. Now, part of the defense argument, as I understand it, is that they had an obligation to do that because of what was done before in terms of uh, victims' families, attorneys, or whatever and that they then have to respond because the defendant has been characterized in, in whatever fashion he has. He's been characterized as a racist or he's been characterized whatever. Uh, but the end result of their, what they've achieved here by this legal medium is they're able to bypass the media. There is not a, a safeguard, if I could, I guess uh, describe it in that way, there is not a safeguard that ethically the media, the, the um, Reporters, both uh, in writing or by um, TV, the editors have an obligation to attempt to be unbiased and attempt to report both sides. There is not. There is the defense decides what they want to put out there or not. 
It's ironic that when the state filed their motion, the defense, what did they do in this case? They, I don't know if it's tweeted or whatever, they sent out through their legal medium a request, and then it went viral, I guess is the way they describe it, but it went all over, so then they had to put it on the website, a request for people to send examples of what, if anything, they had done outrageous so they would be prepared for this. If they hadn't done anything wrong, or if, there, if the appearance, if they didn't feel like anything was even close to the, to the line, why was there a need to do that? Now, maybe it was because they wanted to see what out there was potentially so that they would be prepared. That's their right. But, and I know the court, I got this as part of the defense exhibits, I believe, in terms of the memorandum's attachment. Um, but I, I, I wanted to, to address and, and to provide to the court and to counsel, because obviously they've got it since they created it, is, um, thank you, is th that, that first thing that I spoke of, that is their, their original, um, or what I perceived on October 23rd. Excuse uh, me for one second. This was part of your um, response to memo, so there's no objection to the court. Oh, absolutely no objection. Okay, I would like you to review it. Go ahead, I'm sorry. And your honor, and, 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 and that is part of the defense motion, but quite frankly, in fairness to the defense of that there's no dispute as to what, I have provided more in the sense there is, I don't know that, that his, and, and, and maybe it did, had the commentary by at least one person down there at the bottom. In terms of the, uh, the one uh, Twitter or responder or blogger or whatever word you use to describe this person, and I'm sorry, I can, it's at the very bottom of the first page, Mr. Romero. Oh, no, I, I know, thank you. And, 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 and what the, that person thought is, well, maybe there was something objectionable. The only thing I can think of is there was some commentary for, uh, by the uh, legal website, and it, it reads as follows. For those who have given in the past, for those who have thought about giving, for those who feel Mr. Zimmerman was justified in his actions, for those who feel they would do the same if they were in Mr. Zimmerman's shoes. And, and, and it goes on to say, and this particular writer, uh, I won't mention his name, but he's there, mentioned, felt that maybe that's a point that could be taken out of context for those who feel they would do the same thing in his shoes. So what is occurring here is defense counsel, by way of this medium, is out there talking to the public, and one might argue, one might think, but based on what is said there, like, Hey, put yourself in Mr. Zimmerman's shoes. Is that proper for potential jurors for the public out there? And, and more importantly, if the court reads and what I'm asking for in terms of the gag order, is that substantially, is that substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding due to its creation of an imminent or substantial detrimental effect on that proceeding? I, I would submit it has the potential for doing that. I mean, if, if, if anybody who reads that is saying, hey, basically put yourself in the defendant's shoes, is that proper? That's just one thing. Now, and I know that the, the, the uh, quote was provided again by Mr. O'Meara with, with a bunch of stuff, but I cite one other one, or a few other ones. There was uh, one that read, and I- Mark this marked as an exhibit. Your Honor, the other one is uh, titled, uh, it's, I apologize, it's, And uh, Mr. Romero put part of this. I don't know if the whole thing was in there, but I just wanted to make clear. Give him a minute to look at it. I, I've seen it. Any I, objections? I think I wrote it, so no objections. Okay. Are you seeking to introduce this? Objection? Yes, Your Honor, if I could. It'll come in as um, Exhibit 2. You want to hand it back to me? This one, I'll wait for the. Two good things to mark it before we Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, this one is titled, and I think it's dated October the 10th, 2012, and it's titled Race and the George Zimmerman Case. And it goes on to, to give commentary uh, by somebody in, in uh, defense counsel uh, to talk about what's important or whatnot and why they're reacting a certain way and you know whether race should be an issue or not. Um, 
you know, is that the kind of discourse that, that should occur that the public, that potential jurors are being exposed to uh, by one of the attorneys involved in the case? And, 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 and the reason I, I highlighted that, because the court, I believe, already had the first page, is I have the second page. And, and I think this is very telling from one of the bloggers or one of the responders to this. And I just wanted to highlight what this person said. And I want to highlight certain parts of those paragraphs. First, after reading the Crump interview in its entirety, parentheses, that is, as much as, as it's posted on the site that you link, and a parentheses, I believe your article is misleading. From the second paragraph, at the very last sentence, thus, I would suggest that it is the vigilante nature of the incident that raised our fears and suspicions and it's the death of a teenager carrying Skittles that raised, parentheses, and sustains, parentheses, parentheses, our deepest sorrows. And then the next paragraph, third, the ones that I hear about talking about race at this point are the Zimmerman family and supporters, and now, unfortunately, Mr. Zimmerman's lawyers. So while your article purports to want to keep race out of the case, the fact that the defense side constantly raises it, sends a contradictory message. And your accusation that Mr. Crump is projecting race into the case amounts to, well, projection. Next paragraph. We understand what your job as a legal defense team is, and we value your duty to provide a vigorous defense for the accused. But you degrade your important role when you stoop to targeting, and unfairly so, outsiders who are simply serving their important roles and you might impair your ability to do your job well if you delude yourself into believing that the story here is race rather than murder. And I guess this is not just when one person comments, this is the ability for John Q. Citizen out there, the public, to be reading this. And, and so what I'm trying to do by virtue of this argument and by virtue of these examples is highlight to the court the problem that we are, I would submit it in the court, the public in general, and we as a society, are now having to deal with. It's not that the reporters out there send something and, and publish something. It's now the attorneys are publishing and then commenting about what people say about the case. I think we're going down a slippery slope because I think it's going to be problematic in terms of picking juries. Now the media and, and their response, and I know Mr. Pence, and, um, and I apologize, Mr. Thomas. Thomas, thank you. Ms. Fugate was here previously. Well, we start and say, you know, that happens. That, that's part of the freedom of the press, and that's true. But the question is, should an, should an attorney involved in the case be involved in that? Versus the media, which they have a right to do, reporting on it. I mean, this, I would submit, is groundbreaking breaking in the sense of, we are at a new threshold in society in terms of the fact that now everything is Twittered, now everything is, you know, it's like, why do we go to the trouble when the Supreme Court passed the latest instruction about computers and about not tweeting and not Facebooking and not all that? Why did the Supreme Court address that issue recently? I think it was within the last year in terms of the specific instruction that the jurors now are told, I believe, at the beginning, during the trial, and after. I'm sorry, and, and before they deliberate, about the, the, the fear of the influence of, of that. And, and I think we're headed that way. I think we've already gotten it there. And so I am, I guess, requesting the court to curtail that in some way, to not allow defense counsel to be commenting about the facts of the case. Now, defense counsel will say, and I think in their argument, um, very eloquently talk about we're not really doing that. Let me address a few more points regarding uh, this issue. Regarding, first of all, the, the commentary through the legal uh, website. Uh, I believe it's part of their exhibit, and I, I didn't bring extra copies because I know the court has it as part of their exhibits. It's under exhibit three of their memorandum. It's titled uh, Defense Closing, the George Zimmerman Legal Case Page on Facebook. Um, they talked about how Facebook helped achieve our goals 
And um, their goals were, uh, and I apologize, so I'll let the court take a few minutes to. I have it. Okay. Uh, number one was discrediting and eliminating fraudulent websites and social profiles, providing a forum with communication with a law firm, acknowledging the larger significance of the case. Now, providing a forum for communication with a firm. So, does that mean now that every case, every case before this court or any court, that both sides will be able to go and say, hey, you know, contact us, what do you want to know about the case? Let's, let me tell you my side of it. I mean, wh why do we even pick a jury? Why do we have a trial? And, and more importantly, are we going to be able to pick a jury? And are we going to be able to have a trial where, where it's going to be a fair trial? And then they go on to say how Facebook hasn't helped. Because the problem, and, 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 and that's what I would urge the court to, to emphasize there in terms of how it's not helped, because I think the defense realized that they weren't able to, and I apologize, I may be misstating, and I'll apologize to Mr. Romero profusely if I'm wrong, because he's obviously much more versed on this issue than I am in terms of the media. I think Facebook, there was something where they couldn't control, and I don't mean improperly in terms of control, but uh, the ability of people to respond was kind of beyond their, their, their domain or their control. And so I think that's why they shut it down, but quite frankly, I, I don't, I may be wrong about that, and they're able to discuss it much more eloquently than I am. But the end result is they say that they, they decided to shut it down, and they did. But it was still there for a while. I think Facebook, they're not able to monitor as much, and people are able to respond to one another and communicate without going through the law firm. But, um, so the state's concerned about that. Now, there's another part, and that's also in part of State Exhibit 3, which is titled, ironically, The Responsible Use of Social Media in a Legal Defense. I know the court has, I, I know that it's titled there, and I believe I didn't copy it because it is provided. Right? It's dated uh, uh, May 1st of 2012. I only have two pages under Exhibit 3, and that's what you oh, were just discussing. Oh, I apologize. Let me. I, I don't have it. I want to show you. It's the thick one. I apologize. It's the thick exhibit. And Exhibit 2. One is the website, and two is the... Um, I apologize. It's it's under uh, exhibit number one. I apologize to the court. What's the title of it? It's 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 titled "The Responsible Use of Social Media in a Legal Defense," and it's about uh, I will tell you exactly what page. It's one, two. Mm -hmm. I think it's about thirteen or fourteen pages from the beginning. At least my stack, and I believe all the stacks are the same. It's the, the it? it's ironic that in this particular heading, one of the titles is, we will not use our online presence as a vehicle for dissemination of, nor will we comment on any evidence regarding this case. Now, Jumping forward, defense argument is, as I read it, that they're allowed to comment on the, uh, about the case, that the rule does not prohibit them from commenting about the case. Well, when they created this website, why did they go to all the trouble of, of putting in there that they shouldn't be commenting about the case? They did not realize the impact that it would have on getting a fair trial, on both sides getting a fair trial. It's not just the defendant's right to get a fair trial, it's also the state's right to get a fair trial. And that is the, the state's concern here. And so it's ironic that they're in their own website, they talk about not commenting about the case, maybe things have changed. Maybe now the defense feels that they can comment about the case. But one of the things that they highlight in terms of being responsible is not to comment about the case. So I just take that as another example in terms of the court's consideration in terms of what we're dealing with here. Um, now, at some point during um, this process, there were comments made by a defendant's brother, Robert Zimmerman Jr. And he made some comments out there. He went on a campaign and, and he did some Twitter comments. And the defense is part of their... Uh, legal site, uh, and I believe that's also part of the uh, state's package, but I've got 
uh, I've got the whole, you know, get, uh, I'm given to the court now as an exhibit, and I'd like to put it in evidence. The, uh, no, again, Your Honor, I think I created it. Did I put it into evidence as State's Exhibit 3 to this motion? This is uh, dated October 11, 2012, regarding Robert Zimmerman Jr.'s media campaign and Twitter comments. And basically that they state there, they're distancing to themselves from any of the defendant's brother's comments out there that don't associate the defendant or the law firm with Mr. Zimmerman's brother's comments, that they're not, they're, 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 they're different and they're not uh, vouching for what he says or doesn't say. The reason I, I provided this to the court is on page two of that, pa of, that re of that page, it's interesting that the defense counsel or somebody for the firm, in terms of addressing, I guess, somebody's comment on the middle there, state, we published your co comment because it was a thoughtful look at how people are responding to this case online. We agree with you that there is too much emphasis on taking sides and that there is too much speculation on the discovery that is public information. And now, this is what I want to emphasize to the court. The only proper place for a discussion about the details of what happened the night of February 26th is in court. Well, why can't, all we, why can't we all agree that that should be the, the place to discuss the case and not in the public arena? And that's what the state is asking for. I'm asking for what the defense counsel is telling people that's what should occur. So why, why is there an objection to a gag order to prevent attorneys from talking about the facts of the case or commenting about the credibility of witnesses except in a courtroom, in a proceeding where they're both sides are present and the court is able to monitor and deal with it and where the media can be present. So if they themselves say that, why are we not abiding by that? So again, and, and I'm finishing up with this part of my argument regarding the, the social media. I guess I'm referring to it as social media. I don't know if that's correct or not, but it's the legal website and Twitter, and I know they put Facebook to rest. But there is a concern in terms of the exposure of the public and in terms of commenting about the case. And I go again to Florida Bar Rule 4-3.6, which is what all the courts seem to relate in terms of what can a court legally do to prevent sides from talking about the case? Dissemination of, by means of public communication, if a lawyer knows or reasonably should know that it has the substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding due to its creation of an imminent and substantial detrimental effect on that proceeding. Are we not there yet? Aren't the commentaries that have already occurred doing that? Now let me highlight if I could, and I think, quite frankly, um, I had somebody try to Google Mr. O'Mara, and, and I don't mean to pick on him in terms of this defense counsel in this case, and you know, there was so much stuff, I just, I'm just highlighting a few stuff. And now I am not implying in any way, nor am I stating that his comments, all of them have been improper. I am not saying that at all. I believe, quite frankly, that Mr. O'Mara is an ethical lawyer and tries to do the best he can for his client and has done this in this case. And, and quite frankly, before uh, doing the proceedings in this case, in fact, before I filed the first gag order, I said to him, and you know, he can state what, whether I said or not because there'll be commentary about what was said. But the bottom line is, I said, I think you've, you're, you're crossing the line, but anyway, he, he has an obligation and he knows what he's supposed to do or not do. My concern is that I think we've overstepped that boundary. The defense counsel doesn't agree with that based on their uh, response. But I wanted to highlight certain things. Number one is the defense counsel then with the defendant 
went on national TV, and there the defendant and on the Sean Hannity show talked exclusively about the facts of the case. You know, quite frankly, that would to me would be improper. Would be might, you might argue that's improper. That's talking about the facts of the case, and defense counsel is present. But I'm not objecting to that. I thought it was beneficial to the state, and I'm looking forward to using that and, and potential hearings to trial if necessary. So I want to move on to then. I just highlighted a few instances as what I would submit are examples of where the line was crossed. And on, and on page four of, of my uh, supplemental thing, uh, memorandum, when defense counsel appeared on Pierce Morgan on May the 17th of 2012, and he makes a comment about uh, Mr. Morgan asked the mayor if he agrees with the statement that if Zimmerman had stayed in his car, none of this would have happened. And Mr. O'Mara says yes. The same way as if Trayvon hadn't been in the complex, none of this would have happened. And then there's also talk later about the altercation and who started. But should that comment have been made? Is he, is he responding to what Mr. Morgan said and then he has a right to, that is Mr. O'Mara. On June 21st, 2012, again with Piers Morgan, at approximately one minute in the interview, and, and let me preface this, Mr. Morgan asked O'Mara questions about the perjury claims against George and his wife. He labeled it as perjury claims. And uh, O'Mara said that Zimmerman's credibility was affected. And he will have to deal with it, but his credibility isn't necessary for everything. And approximately one minute into the interview, Mr. O'Mara said, as we discussed, his credibility was certainly affected. Now, he's talking about his client there, that his credibility was affected by the fact that he standed mute when his wife said something that turned out to be misrepresentation to the court about the funds. And, we're gonna and they're going to have to deal with that. And he talks about the credibility. Should he be commenting about the credibility of his own client? There's a quote from Witness 9 regarding statements that she made, something happened to her when she was young, and it occurred by the actions of this defendant. Mr. O'Mara, in response to that, states uh, some of the effect of a uh, witness number nine called police anonymously the day before and claimed the whole Simmerman family was racist. And Mr. O'Mara referenced the FBI interviews of some people that said Simmerman was not a racist. And he says, because of this, her credibility is questioned. So you have potentially, I'm sorry, the, the quote was, I would suggest that maybe her first statement suggested the racism questions her credibility. So the next day she makes up allegations about sexual abuse. So what we have now is a potential witness, may testify, may not, but a defense counsel commenting about the credibility of a witness. Is that not stepping over the line? I mean, are we gonna have now every witness that is a potential witness in this case Defense counsel commenting about, oh, he's a credible witness. Oh, she's not. He's credible. She's not. I mean, how far do we go? Do, does, okay, and if the court allows that, does then the state get to rebut and go, oh, he's credible. He's not. I mean, how, how far do we go? The next one I have is uh, one that was done by a local TV station. I think it was WFTV. I think it's Orlando 9, August 13, 2012. Mr. O'Mara, in that interview, stated, I quote, I think, and I want to emphasize the word think, the facts suggest that in this case, that what probably, emphasize probably, happened was my client was reacting to having his, having his nose broken, which I think, emphasize think, is probably undisputed that he had a broken nose now. Again, that's Mr. O'Mara commenting about what he thinks. So then, what's, what's, if it's fair, then the state the next day go, oh no, what it is is his, head, his nose wasn't broken. I mean, are we gonna have a back and forth every day, competing news conferences as to what the state believes the evidence is and then what, is, isn't that supposed to occur in a courtroom? Isn't that what we ask jurors to come and make a judgment on the credibility of witnesses and assess what was said or not said and get to the truth? But if we're going to partake in terms of both sides, because I would submit if, if 
the court's saying, okay, there's no necessary gag order. I think everything is said is proper. Or I think so. Anyway, whatever the court's ruling is, does that mean that the state gets to go up there and go, okay, this witness is credible, this witness is not? I don't believe this witness because of these. I ethically don't think I can do that. But if we're saying it's okay, I then, I then want to move to now some newspaper articles, and there was a lot of them. Orlando Sentinel has covered this case ex exclusively, and so has the Miami Herald, and we pulled some of them. And I've, I've listed the quotes, but I've got the entitled to, uh, to uh, submit hearsay evidence. Uh, and I agree. I just want to make the, sure it's clear. The rules clear. of evidence are not relaxed. It's just what is allowed in this type of a hearing. For both the state and the defense. Absolutely. Oh, it's four. State's four. And what I've, I've tended to the court are um, evidence in terms of the Orlando Sentinel, uh, September 29th, where Mr. O'Mara was interviewed. And he was asked questions. about the case. Now, on, on, on the uh, page seven of nine, at least from the top, in terms of the court hopefully being able to, I think it's page seven of nine of that, and the court obviously has the whole package there, but um, Mr. Romero makes comments about, the, I would submit that that shouldn't have occurred. He states, he was asked about uh, another attorney had a big mess to clean up when you joined the uh, case. What do you say about that? That meaning Mr. Romero had a big uh, thing to clean up from prior attorneys. Uh, and he said, obviously I may not have allowed George to make all of the statements that he made to police. I'm not concerned that he made those statements now because I think they're all pretty consistent. Now, there he is commenting about facts of evidence. Quite frankly, there's other, I think in his legal website or, or in other places where he comments about they're inconsistent, that he can deal with them. And I think I've, I've actually highlighted those for the court. But you have defense counsel now commenting about statements made by the defendant that they're consistent. And he talks about the, uh, the one eyewitness who really seemed to see the events. He's commenting now about what a witness, well, there's a bunch of witnesses. Is now the state supposed to go, okay, hold on. How about the lady who was upstairs who was looking down and saw something. How about the, the lady that was looking and saw people, one were chasing another one? How about that? I mean, how far do we go in terms of trying to, which is this is what's occurring, we're trying to influence potential jurors. We want to get them on our side. That is, that's what the defense counsel is doing. Why else would you be commenting about facts of the case unless you're trying to convince people who are going to be the ultimate judges of this defendant's guilt or innocence to, to, to get on your side. Why else would you be making comments about this? Why is it necessary for defense counsel to speak about the facts of this case and to pass judgment or, or to talk about the credibility of witnesses, but for the fact that they want to influence not the public in general, it, well, obviously the public in general, but more particular, the potential jurors. Let me, let me uh, submit something to the court. Let's say we have a self-defense stand your ground, whatever we call it. Let's say we have a hearing. Let's say that occurs in March. Are we then going to have commentary after that as to what exactly occurred or not if the court makes a proceeding that it should go to trial? Are we going to have then, well, when the defendant testified, what he really meant to say was this. I mean, is there going to be commentary about what occurred? I mean, how far do we go? On page eight of that uh, same interview of the defendant by the Orlando, I believe it's the Orlando Sentinel, it's ironic that defense counsel is asked, is it getting harder for people to change their minds, isn't it? Or, I'm sorry, it's getting harder for people to change their minds, isn't it? 
answer we're getting, Mr. Romero, we're getting cemented in incomplete evidence. If I have a frustration about what I have to deal with in the courtroom, now we have to deal with those potential jurors who have incomplete information. So what is occurring now? He's going to fill in the blanks on favorable stuff so that they have a complete information of potential jurors. Your Honor, with all due respect, have we not crossed that line in terms of materially, materially prejudicing an adjudicated proceeding due to its creation of an imminent and substantial detrimental effect on that proceeding? So the, the response there is we have to deal with potential jurors who have incomplete information. We need to at least sensitize them to how incomplete their information was. So I'm not really talking to the public. I am talking to you, juror number one. You, juror number two. I want to tell you what's really the truth, at least my version of the truth. Then later on that same page is Mr. O'Mara uh, making comments about uh, what the defendant is or is not in terms of his family members. Is that proper? The next article I have is, is uh, the May 2nd, 2012. Um, uh, Miami Herald, I apologize. He's talking about, uh, in terms of comments about uh, his client's MySpace account in which uh, the defendant talked about uh, commentary, negative commentary about uh, Mexicans. And so again, he's saying, well, yeah, that's been hacked and not, but their post, the Miami Herald story is accurate in that the defendant did make derogatory comments about Mexicans. They were written by his client. And on page three of that, uh, he said he began his foray into social media in part to response to the avalanche of emails and phone calls that were overwhelming his office. It'd be irresponsible to ignore the robust debate taking place online about his client. Is that what we're supposed to be doing? June 4th, 2012 article, and I apologize, Miami Herald also. And uh, Mr. Romero again commenting about uh, his client. Third quote there, Mr. Zimmerman understands that his mistake has undermined his credibility, which we, we will have to work to repair. I'm trying to explain in terms of the money, why there was lies or misstatements or mistakes, or whatever we want to call the um, hiding of the money. On uh, Miami Herald, July 17, 2012, uh, the witness number nine accused uh, Mr. Uh, Zimmerman of something. Uh, Mr. Romero on page two of that uh, article uh, re refers to as the accusation as a side tornado that comes with a hurricane. And then he says it's completely irrelevant and now we have to waste 50 hours and somebody will never make it in the courtroom. He, the defendant, meaning the defendant denies it, he is saying that it never happened. Now, him, that's the defendant commenting, I'm sorry, the defense attorney commenting about what the defendant is saying or not saying. That hasn't been reported anywhere, but that's what he, you know, believes the defendant is saying or not saying. Again, is that proper? Um, and then the Miami Herald, September 20th, 2012, um, talking about the story about, uh, I believe it was the Ostermans who ended up writing a book in this case and also appeared on Dr. Phil's. And that is dated September 20th, 2012, Mr. Romero's on page three of that um, article, Mr. Romero is commenting about, now he's saying, he never had heard about a struggle for the gun. He did read a draft of the book before it was published, but felt asking Osterman to change details would amount to witness tampering. Quote, he's a friend of George is trying to explain George to be a different than the way he was perceived to be great. That's a story that's not been told, Romero said. I don't like him talking about things George spoke to him about in confidence. 
I don't like yet another statement of George out there for review. It's more of a headache. Mr. O'Mara, although he questioned whether Osterman's memory is accurate, admitted, Mr. O'Mara admitted that between Zimmerman's various interviews to police, his father, and brothers of counsel the press, and now Osterman's, there are se several variations of what happened that night. But he characterized the discrepancies as surmountable obstacle. If everybody's story was exactly the same, then it would smack of a lie. And towards the bottom of that page, we will be able to respond to the six, seven, eight different renditions of the story and how and why there are different statements. The jury's going to believe what the jury's going to believe. Reference about that, all of his statements were consistent. Now he's saying they're inconsistent. But that is what jurors are being told in terms of the defendant's statements. Now it is, I think the last thing is he's made six, seven, eight different statements and we'll just have to deal with it. Is, is the defense counsel allowed to talk about that? About the facts of the case? Your Honor, in conclusion, um, case is set for trial June 10th, 2013. This case has had an extensive amount of publicity, not just by the print or the uh, television media, but the internet, social media, et cetera. Where do we stop? Where do we have the ability for both sides to get a fair trial without commentary by counsel? And so I would submit that and ask this honorable court to enter an order prohibiting any attorney involved with the prosecution or defense of this case or any personnel employed or affiliated with said attorneys and law enforcement personnel from making or releasing any extrajudicial statements to the media about the following facts of the case, any evidence or the lack thereof in this case, the strength or weaknesses in the case, the credibility or the lack of credibility of any potential witnesses, and opinions about guilt or innocence, and any appropriate or anticipated penalty. And I guess I'll just wait to, to, if I could, just respond to whatever arguments very briefly that are made by defense counsel, because I just don't have, obviously, defense counsel, Mr. O'Mara, uh, but also the media attorneys. Okay, thank um, you. Um, thank you. Mr. Miller or Mr. Millett, please make your argument. I'm going to, it might make sense to have Mr. Ponce make his arguments on behalf of the media so that they have that of record. I'm sorry. I, I know. Or, I'm sorry. Whoever's going to. I think you should go. Okay. And I have read your response in your memo. Okay. Um, Macintosh, of course, was in 1977 before we had an internet and before we had cable TV, I think. We had some cable TV, but it certainly wasn't what it was today. And it was also 14 years before. The case that I think really rules our decision-making process here today, and that's genteel. And I know that you've read that, and I've cited a number of different ways in my, um, my response, but, but I, I just can't get away from the idea of having to highlight a little bit about what genteel tells us. But well, I'm going to do it in the context of what we've been responding to. Um, racist murderer shot a young unarmed kid through the heart, um, tracked him down, went after him, profiled him, confronted him, attacked him. Um, for racist reasons, and um, because, according to the state, actually, because of ill will and hatred. Um, and that comes from the state's surrogate. That comes from Benjamin Crump and Natalie. Now, Crump and Jackson needed a media strategy on March 5th. This is 10 days after the event. Jackson brought in Ryan Jewelson, a publicist who had worked with her in a number of high-profile cases. After speaking, speaking with Tracy Martin, Jewelson said he would take the job for free and then went to work pitching the story to national media. Crump knew from his experience on the boot camp case that publicity could force officials to act, but it would require persuading two people who, had never understood, who never stood before a television camera 
to withstand the spotlight. I got on the phone with Tracy Martin and told him, it's not gonna be any fun, but this is the only way to find justice, Juleson said. You're gonna have to bury your soul and express your emotions and inner grief. Martin and Fulton agreed. There's only one problem. At first, the media wasn't interested. Juleson pitched the story to a long list of media contacts. Eventually, on March 7th, Reuters, Reuters published the story. So, here's what we are starting this with. Now, unfortunately, we start with the unfortunate death of a 17-year-old boy. And, and we all know that it was unfortunate. The facts will speak for themselves, but they seem to be out there in a number of different ways. I say that because it really is the context under which we have to look at how we are to be acting in this case. Crump and Natalie Jackson decided they were going to make this a national media case, as they did other cases, because sometimes there are pots of gold at the end of this case that don't just include criminal justice. They include a lot more than that. So they bring on a publicist to bring out the case. Now, did they bring out the facts of the case? One would truly have hoped, because that would make a lot of sense. But what they decided to do instead was to simply just come up with a selling point. And what was their selling point? Benjamin Crump from Piers Morgan got out of his car in the rain, profiled, pursued, confront Trayvon Martin, and then kill him in cold blood even though he was unarmed. This is, in fact, the words of a surrogate for the state. Not saying that they were in a conspiracy, but the reality is what they are doing is presenting the state's case. Crump, of course, argues time and time again, but I'll show you a couple, that the entire Sanford Police Department is racist. Matter of fact, he goes on to state, in effect, that the state attorney's office is racist because they wouldn't prosecute. So what he does say, again to Pierce Morgan, we don't know why the powers that be at Sanford Police Department and the state attorney's office have conspired to sweep the murder of Trayvon Martin under the rug. Now, Mr. Crump carries an Esquire after his name as well, and is just as bound as I am by 4-3.6. And then further on, and again, we have the videos, so I'm not gonna bore you with all of it, but I will present it to you if you want. Mr. Crump disputes the evidence, doesn't exist, and agrees that there's an attempt to cover up the SPD investigation. And what does he say? Tampa Bay Times article. In court you have the jury, Crump says, our job is to get the case to a jury. We need to fight first in the court of public opinion. The jury, is the American people. His plan, and I guess he's entitled to it, is to completely sway national public opinion on this case in favor of his client, the Martin family, to allege their story that my client committed a heinous act of murder. Now, though I guess he has First Amendment rights as well, and though I believe he's as well bound by our rules, he has decided to take a story, and I would argue to you, spin it. Because he says, for example, and, and I'll, again, the video clip is available, but basically what he says is when the, the, a video was leaked um, by the same media company that Mr. Crump was with during an interview of his heretofore unknown witness. But anyway, a media video, a police video is leaked by the media showing Mrs. Zimmerman walk past a camera. And he uses that to say, the cops are conspiring against my client. It is obvious there are no injuries on Mr. Zimmerman, and therefore, they're racist, and this is a conspiracy. Words like that, and look at the video, decide for yourself. What's interesting, however, is that when we fast forward to the state's press conference and they tell us in the press conference 
that Mr. Crump and Mr. Parks were in daily contact with them since their involvement in the case, that means that they were involved with them when Mr. Zimmerman's records, um, medical records, were disclosed to Sanford PD because they had them by March 2nd. So it would seem, since they had daily contact with the investigation, that Mr. Crump would then be a, a, a aware of the records that suggested the injury to the face and the back. They were similarly aware then, because SPD have it, of the picture that I took us, of the picture of Mr. Zimmerman in the police car with the blood on his nose and on his face, and also the pictures taken at Sanford PD with the blood on the back. I mentioned that not to talk to you about a whole bunch of blood, but when we are looking at what Mr. Crump and his camp have done to this case, it is particularly relevant for us to look at the environment into which Mr. Zimmerman was thrown. Since his involvement in March, they have traveled the countryside, travel the nation, the Martin family, and Mr. Crump and Ms. Jackson, and, and again, sort of their entourage. Uh, and they have pitched this very same story across America that Mr. Zimmerman is a racist murderer. And those are his words, not mine. Um, to argue that that is, that there should be some justice. Well, I'm very, very aware of this case the facts of the case, and how justice is going to be had in this case. But here's the problem. Today's Sentinel Star, Sentinel, tell how long I've lived here, it used to be the Sentinel Star. Today's Sentinel, today, after everything that the state seems to think that I've accomplished, and we'll talk about the, the efficacy of what I've done as far as the people who the website, who's actually seen the website, but today, 72% of the people believe George Zimmerman cannot get a fair trial. What should that percentage be? 50-50? No. We all know what it really should be when we think about it. That should be zero. That should be zero. I should not have to talk to a jury, potential jury, 6, 8, 10, 12 months from now and say, just curious, are you one of the 72% that thinks he's not going to get a fair trial and maybe will that help me or will that hurt me? And Why do you think that? What infected you to the point that you think my client can't get a fair trial in this case. Well, what's infected him, that juror, that potential juror, is what's been going on in this case. And it's been run, unfortunately, by a publicity team that is getting a great deal of yardage out of keeping a story alive. Now, I could easily go into how the story is untrue, but that's evidence and we don't need to, that's not the point here today, is whether or not the story is, is true or, or why the story is not true. I think it's significant that it's untrue for this reason. We go back now to Gentile and what constraints exist with lawyers. Now, I don't know what constraints, I, I barely, well I did not know what constraints existed in 77 because I wasn't a practicing lawyer. I do know what Gentile told us in 1991, and, and Gentile was decided upon when I think the internet may have been identified, but it wasn't active. Um, and certainly, we don't have what we have in 2012. Now, I half joked as a remedy to this in my response to you when I said, just turn off the media and just turn off the internet, and then we'll be okay. Then things will settle down, Things will calm down, and we won't have to worry about it. But Gentile, though they didn't know it was coming, really said that in Gentile, the Nevada State Bar, their restrictions on lawyers commenting were greater than ours. Because under ours, you get that second level where it has to be an imminent and immediate threat to the proper presentation of justice. That, that add-on in Florida is a stricter, you would have to show 
for example, I know you know the argument that I, I was acting in such a way that my comment was imminently going to threaten the administration of justice. Um, but let's just stick with Gentile for a moment and, and its standards and what it says in Gentile, which I think I'm surprised that it wasn't even referenced by the state because it is, in fact, the standard that we, you must decide this, this, this case on, uh, this, this suggestion. So looking at Gentile, and again, I, I, I'm going to belabor it just a slight bit, knowing that you've already read it. Um, one, one level that I contend exists in this case, and that's why I just went through everything that we are fighting against, is I contend to you that the case against Mr. Zimmerman was created for reasons far outside the facts of what happened that night. And I get that because we've now some, done some discovery. I get that because of the motion that's still pending, which is when I sit down with a Sanford police officer and he tells me that everybody in Sanford Police Department from the chief to the investigator and the other 11 or 10 in between made the decision that there is not sufficient evidence to try this case, to charge this case. And when he also tells me that the state attorney's office was involved in that situation for the last week of that decision-making process, and they too agreed that there was not enough evidence to even charge this case because they read 776 and looked at what has to be shown and what has to be defeated in order to charge somebody with a crime. When they tell me that in a deposition, and then when I see that what was planned in that same, and, and now that we're finding out this discovery, what was planned was a presentation to the grand jury, which you would think would be an appropriate way to handle a case of this magnitude and maybe this concern. When that decision is then taken away from the local state attorney by the governor and given to an out of area prosecutor who then doesn't avail themselves of the grand jury process, and I've made this in a motion before, and he reminded me in his response they don't have to, and I get that. They could charge it with whatever they want. But when that decision is made not to even take it to a grand jury, and I sit back and I say to my client, there's something afoot here. There's something afoot well beyond what he did that night. And what that is, is political influence. And I don't say that just because Gentile says that if it's political speech, it's further protected. Tell me where the facts don't support that everyone who looks at this case initially doesn't think it should be charged, and yet, lo and behold, the governor involves himself in the process, and we have a second-degree murder charge under these facts. I contend to you, just as Gentile contended to his public, that he has an absolute right, not right, the obligation to balance what has been done to Mr. Zimmerman. And I know that you've read through the Gentile, and I highlight some of the comments that say, the Supreme Court noted that Gentile's speech, and let's not forget, Gentile's speech was, this is a cover-up. The cops actually did it, and they're making my guy the scapegoat. Now, I'm not saying cops did that tonight, but uh, uh, did that that night. But the reality is there is at least questions now from the deposition of one witness um, as to what the true motivation was. And when we look at Gentile, it tells us very specifically that we have the absolute right to comment on that. Supreme Court stated, there is no question that speech critical of the state's power lies to the very center of the First Amendment. Nevada, in that case, seeks to punish the dissemination of information relating to alleged government misconduct, which only last term we described as speech, which has traditionally been recognized at li as lying at the core of the First Amendment. It would be difficult, they go on to state, to single out any aspect of government of higher concern and importance to the people than the manner in which criminal trials are conducted. 
And they say that it is, in fact, the press. In Shepard versus Maxwell, an excellent case for looking at the, the, the need for the press involvement. The press guards against the miscarriage of justice by subjecting police, prosecutors, and the judicial processes to extensive public scrutiny and criticism. Pu public awareness and criticism have even greater importance where, as here, they concern allegations of police corruption. And as I say in the top of page three of my memo, I, I do not want it to be uncertain that over the last several weeks, it has become apparent to Mr. Zimmerman that there is something afoot here. And we should not be stopped from doing at the very heart of the First Amendment, which is to bring that to light. And we know that because 72% of the people seem to have bought the story hook, line, and sinker already. And that's what we're trying to fight against. So further, um, when we look at what Gentile did and what, they, what he said, the court summarized his desires, Gentile's desires, by saying rather than it being an admission that he sought to materially prejudice an adjudicated proceeding, petitioners sought only to stop a wave of publicity that he perceived as prejudicing potential jurors against his client and injuring his client's reputation in the community. Let's, just for a moment, let's think about Mr. Zimmerman's reputation in his community today. He's been in hiding. <coughs> well, let's back up just a little bit. He was in hiding, then he involved himself every time the police wanted him to come in. He gave in, he came went in, back into the state when they wanted him to. He gave several statements. There'll be arguments over whether or not there are inconsistencies, but he voluntarily gave several statements, took a voice dress analysis, did a recreation of the scene, did a, a voice where he would, out the, when he screamed for help that night, he was acting it out again so they can try and compare it. He did everything they wanted him to do. And what's his reputation in the community today? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, as to what people think of Mr. Zimmerman, why 72% of the people think he won't get a fair trial, and why today he's wearing a bulletproof vest and living in hiding. So, if Gentile is to be given life in this courtroom, then let's give life to the very words of the Supreme Court when they tell us that responding to that tidal wave of information against Mr. Zimmerman is not only appropriate, but the Supreme Court says that's exactly what we're supposed to do. An attorney's duties, they tell us, do not begin at the courtroom door. He or she cannot ignore the practical implications of a legal proceeding for the client, just as an attorney may recommend a plea bargain in a, or a civil settlement to avoid adverse consequences and possible loss after trial, so an attorney may take reasonable steps to defend their client's reputation and to reduce the adverse consequence of indictment, especially in the face of a prosecution deemed unjust or commenced with improper motives. A defense attorney may pursue lawful strategies to obtain dismissal of the indictment or reduction of charges, including an attempt to demonstrate in the court of public opinion that the client does not deserve to be tried, Gentile, 1043. We had a website. We have a website. Very unique. I've never done one before. I've never heard of one done before. And as I stayed in here, I did it because the day that I got involved in the case, 75 reporters showed up outside my door. It was this amazing little crescent around my front door. 2,000 emails closed down both of my email accounts, and it closed down my phone system. And we needed something to do. So having never really, I've dealt with high profile cases before, but obviously nothing like this. So we got extra lines, we got extra, we got extra emails, and then we decided we will do a website. We will not advertise on that website. We will talk to the Florida Bar about it before. They haven't made a final decision, but we pass it all by them, and they said it's not advertising. 
just be careful. And we created a website with principles to try and figure out how we could accomplish some of what we needed to accomplish, which is dealing with the enormity of information flow in this case and doing it in a way where, in effect, we can sort of stick our fingers into the enormous, not even current, torrent of information that's flowing past us in this case to see what's there. So we come up with a website. And we come up with a website, and, and, and we made these up. I mean, this is, we didn't get this from a textbook. We sat down and tried to figure out how we're going to do this in a way that is ethically proper, how responsible, in a case where we, we do, of course, have a 17-year-old a, a victim who's passed away, um, and do it in a way that makes some sense, but zealously represents Mr. Zimmerman. Now, um, I will tell you that the internet has provided an enormous, enormous amount of information. It has, some of it is horrid, some of it is racist, some of it is, is full of hate, um, and some of it is really good information. There are people out there who spend 100 hours looking at some of this evidence and, and digesting it. I'm sure that the state has benefited from them emailing him, and I'm benefiting from the people that they're emailing me. Well, you know, this is 2012, and I'm sorry, but we, I, I used to have the books on the shelf. Those days are long gone. Um, we now have a, an active vehicle of information that I will tell you, not today, but 10 years from now, if a defense attorney is not searching the internet for information like this, then they're committing malpractice. So we decide we're going to open up a website, and you have it in front of you, so I won't bore you with many more of the details except to say that we tried to come up with a, a plan to present our internet presence in a way that makes sense but protects the process as best we can. So if I might just have a moment, uh, I do want to go over those with you very quickly. Um, you have it in front of you, I think, the okay. seven rules. Um, and, and within that, what we have tried to do, realizing that we were going to have an internet presence, of course, that was the first decision that was made, we decided to fill out those principles. And within those principles, we say exactly what's there. I'm not, you can, you've read it or can read it. Um, and the, the purpose of which, the entirety, the, the the global purpose of which was that we would respect the process, we would respect the individual, and that we would use it appropriately to gather information, to act as a source for information for the media, who of course was still completely inundating all of my staff with requests, and we did it in a way that we thought would be at least principally appropriate. So. Um, if you have that, then and, and I would suggest to you that that is a way to properly do this. Um, we have modified it along the way. You'll see that in, in the various, um, I do want to make sure that you have all of the, uh, the information that I intended to forward to you, so you give me one second. Um, we've done it in a way that try to be reactive to changes, um, for example, the state mentioned Facebook. Facebook was an opportunity that we came up with, again, to try and allow some discourse, but if you look at the discourse we allowed, we did not involve ourselves in it. When it finally sort of ran its course and it devolved into something that was just a lot of people bickering back and forth, we decided that that wasn't purposeful anymore, and we took down Facebook. Um, it's there, if you want to look and see what's on it, if you have an internet, we'll go right through it right now. You can see what's on it, but I will tell you that the information flow that's on there, and I'll present it to you in a second, was, um, was as clean as we could make it in this new day and age of an internet presence. Um, and then we have Twitter. 
And if you look at our Twitters, I'm sorry, I used to get that right, look at our tweets, you will find that we are intentionally um, vanilla with what we say. If you, the majority of our tweets are very simply that. They are, here is information that was filed. Um, I would challenge the state to, find, to suggest to me that there is anything on that presence that is advocacy. Now, to back up, I think I can advocate. The suggestion that the state is saying that we not comment on the evidence, I've, I've, it's, I may have caused that problem because I told Mr. Deleonda early on that I don't think that it's good to comment on evidence. There is no prohibition to that. The 4-3.6 doesn't say you're not allowed to comment on the evidence. Um, there's truly no prohibition on commenting on a particular piece of evidence, particularly if they're in controversy. Um, but I, I've been very hesitant to do it, but I just want to be clear that it's my position that there is not an affirmative obligation. The Supreme Court case out of 1977 suggested, but that is not what is followed up with in the Gentile case. Um, nor is it followed up by with any of the more recent Florida cases that deal with it. But, um, now let's talk for a moment about after we realize the context, the um, universe that we are now forced to live in in 2012, um, let's see, now talk about for a moment what effect um, we've really had. I actually have somebody who can testify to it, but I'm going to try and move it along by just giving you the hearsay version myself, and if it needs clarification, we can certainly do that. But um, the nice thing about living in the world of Google is they keep records of everything. They actually have every search they've ever done, which is in the over trillions or whatever the next quadrillions is. But one thing they do is they keep track of, of all internet traffic on all websites and all searches. So I will tell you and present it more formally if you need it, that um, when this, when the Trayvon Martin um, passing occurred, when the event that night occurred, over the next week or so, and in direct relation to the March 5th presentation by the Crump um, group, um, there was approximately um, 50, thousand hits or volumes for the word Trayvon Martin. Twenty, I said thousands, I meant millions, um, for George Zimmerman as of when that happened. That is now down to date to well less than 2% of that for each one. In our site, the site that's being complained of by the state, we have had a total of 263 visits. Um, unique visitors, meaning a couple of people come back more than once, 157. So 157,000 different people looked at something on our site over the six months it's been around. Um, and they you know, would look about one page or two, there's like several on it, but they look at it. What's, what's interesting is when we start drilling down into that and what that means, because that's of course nationwide. Um, if in fact we look at those visits in the central Florida area, an area from which we would potentially pick a jury, um, and we've done the numbers, actually Google has done all of the numbers, of the potential jury venare that we would pick from, less than one half of one percent people have looked at that website. Now, I really wish I could say that 60% of the population looked at it, but less than one half of 1% of the people. And part of the reason for that is, is simple. This is not broadcast media. Websites are, I don't have the right term, got to go to it media. You have to want to go to it. I, we don't, websites don't broadcast out to anything. 
like some of these, what they call pop-ups, where you're just sitting there and it says, buy this. When, if you want to visit that website, GZ Legal Case, you have to decide to go to it. Um, which I would suggest, similar, it's, it's funny because Mr. Deliranda suggested some recent um, rulings by the Supreme Court on tweeting. We don't want jurors to tweet because we don't want them to get any information except from beginning to opening the case. Um, but we also have to look at, you know, what's out there that, what the traffic is and what it might support and what people do. In the same sense, the Supreme Court has said that they're considering changing the way we look at website because it's not on demand, it's on demand. It's not broadcast, you have to go look for it. And they have sort of de determined, now they can look at even the advertising rules differently because if someone wants to go to your website, similarly in this case. So, um, starting to be a long-winded way to say um, what we have done was deal with a case that when it got to my doorstep was already in the throes of an enormous overriding tidal wave of misinformation, I would contend, but supported seemingly by some of these anecdotal statements I've said, like 72% of the people don't believe they'll get a fair trial. So when we then take that back one last time to Genteel, and it tells us that what we are supposed to do is to attend to affect that negative information that exists because of outside sources. It's usually the prosecution and the police. We all know about the perp walk. You know, it, cameras are there, guys head down, walking around. Well, you know, now what we have is the internet. So it's all over the place. And had, I don't blame them, because were they here today, they would say to you, we have an absolute First Amendment right to present our client's case in as zealous a manner as we can. And if we're looking to get money from a homeowners association or something like that, and we can suggest that your client's guilty or your homeowners association is guilty, they can do all that. I, I, I am troubled that that avalanche of information or misinformation now falls and buries my client. I just don't think we can do anything about it. What we shouldn't do about it, however, is to say that the state surrogate, or at least someone acting in a consistent fashion with the state's position, um, can have unfettered access, as they've well shown, to the media, um, to social media, um, and that the one person who represents Mr. Zimmerman and who does his presentation under certain rules and regulations um, and in a way that seemingly, and I argue to you, is nowhere near close to the balance of 4-3.6 when we looked at it in 2012, um, that you not deny my client's First Amendment rights, first of all, but more importantly, um, his Sixth Amendment rights. Because after all, when we look at what the Sixth Amendment really does tell us, and it's somewhat instructive, we tend to not think about it sometimes, and we tend to just go on by and say, don't worry, he'll get a fair trial. Um, but what the Sixth Amendment says to us is that he is to be protected Because in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state. Now, the state is saying that I'm making the jury impartial. But because I go in there and say, yeah, George's credibility uh, was affected because he didn't tell the absolute this or the money question. Yeah, okay. And that that somehow is going to violate 4-3.6, saying that there is an imminent threat to the proper administration of justice. If I go on Pierce Morgan and say, wait until you hear all the evidence. Um, since we're talking about hearsay, if I present to you Professor Gillers out of New York University, 
who came out and said, this is the most ethically appropriate way to handle social media, he's the ethics professor at New York University School of Law, that he's handled. If I was to bring a sitting state attorney, not an assistant state attorney, but the state attorney who called me up un unasked and left a note that said he and his entire office believe that the way that you're handling this case have quelled the fires that were brewing in Seminole County, have brought a, peace, a sense of peace to this case, uh, and have done it in a way that they're proud to call me a brother lawyer, then that's actually the way this is supposed to be handled in 2012. Because what we can't do is ignore the reality that the Sixth Amendment tells us that we have to make sure, although the state gets their right to a fair trial, we know who the Sixth Amendment talks about. And we know that right now, if we pick a, a jury tomorrow, we gotta go through seven of 10 of those potential jurors and go, why don't you think you'll get a fair trial? And we really know why. Because they think he's guilty. They've listened to it all. They've listened to every word of it. They've heard Mr. Crump time and time again just say that he's killed a child. They've looked at the picture of the 12-year-old and they said, how could you do that? Right? We know that that's what's happening. Now, if I was on the top of a mountain screeching it out, Okay. If I violate 4-3.6, someone should tell me. Well, what shouldn't happen is you shouldn't sit here and say, everyone else can talk. We can do all that. But Mr. Zuman, not happening. I'm going to shut your lawyer down because the 1977 case says I can. I'm going to ignore everything that the United States Supreme Court and Gentile tells me a good criminal defense attorney is over here. And I'm just asking you, let me do it as long as I do it the way I'm supposed to, which is ethically and within the bounds of advocacy, and more importantly, the bounds of our rules. Thank you very much. Mr. Plum? Your Honor, if I'm counting right, we've had about an hour and a half's worth of argument on this motion. And I know these are sometimes famous attorney last words, but I, I'm not going to be very long. I want to bring this back to the standard Your Honor has to apply. The, the standard that was, I've been working with this case for a long time, and I'm never sure whether it's Gentile or Gentile, but that case, it sets out the standard as it's been followed by Florida in, in the Rodriguez and Aquamar decisions that we cited in our papers. And the standard Your Honor has to apply is, are statements substantially likely to materially prejudice this trial? That jurors have heard about it. The goal of this process is, is, is to put people in that box and not be concerned whether they've heard Mr. Romero speak before or if they see him and say, you know what, I remember seeing him on TV. I remember reading about him. That's not the goal. Prejudice, as it's used in this test about substantially likely to materially prejudice proceeding, prejudice means that the people sitting in that box cannot be impartial, that they will not decide the case on the evidence despite your admonishments to them that they will. Mr. Delarionda said, there's been so much publicity out there and so much talk, and this case has had so much publicity that it might take us weeks and weeks to do voir dire. I say that's exactly right. Our Constitution, in the cases interpreting our Constitution, say that a gag order is the last alternative. That if it takes weeks to do voir dire to make sure we impanel impartial jury, that's what we have to do. It's a combination of voir dire admonishments to the jury, but if that's what's necessary, that's what has to be done. I want to read, and we cited the Murphy decision in our paper from the U.S. Supreme Court, and this is cited at 421 U.S. 794, and it's a 1961 decision. The U.S. Supreme Court said, to hold that the mere existence of any preconceived notion as to the guilt or innocence of an accused without more is sufficient to rebut the presumption of a prospective juror's impartiality would be to establish an impossible standard. It is sufficient if the juror can lay aside his impression or opinion and render a verdict based on the evidence presented in the court. So what this comes down to, Your Honor, is have you been presented evidence? Has evidence been given to you that the only way to make sure we have an impartial jury, not an ignorant jury, the only way to make sure we have an impartial jury 
is to issue a gag order saying no one involved with the case can speak. And, and, and restate it a little bit. If your honor was going to sit down and write an order, and the cases are clear that if you're going to issue a gag order, you have to make specific findings of fact showing how the evidence establishes the standard. If your honor was going to write that order, what evidence could you possibly point to that it's going to be impossible to seat an impartial jury unless you gag the attorneys? I don't think there's evidence been presented to that. And Mr. Omara read extensively from Gentile, and, and, and I'm not going to go through that again. But I think that decision makes clear that it is very hard to issue a gag order. The state has not cited any decisions in its paper where any time recently a court has entered a gag order. And it's just because it just doesn't happen anymore. The modern trend is to do exactly like Judge Lester did at the beginning of this case, is to remind the parties, the counsel for the parties, that they're governed by Florida Rule of Professional Conduct 4-3.6. And earlier at the beginning of the hearing when we were de dealing with a different topic, your honor said, the attorneys are officers of the court and you expect them to abide by the rules that come with being an officer of a court. And that's exactly what you should do here. Let 4-3.6 and these attorneys and everyone's attorney be guided by those rules. It's dangerous when a court starts wading into what is permissible discourse about a subject. We shouldn't have courts telling people what they can talk about, what they should talk about, or I'm concerned if you say X, people in the blogosphere are going to say Y. It's dangerous when we start getting into a situation where we're having the state of Florida ask a circuit court judge to start wading into what people should or shouldn't say. When we start going there, that's a dangerous place. And your honor, unless you have any questions about things in our paper, that's my presentation. Well, thank you very much. No, I don't. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, your honor. Your honor, just to reiterate very briefly what Mr. Pond said, the standard here is very high. You're dealing with not only the First Amendment and the Sixth Amendment, but a history of dialogue in cases. I was lead counsel in the Danny Rawling case where Judge Morris told both the lawyers what the requirements were, and there was no gag order entered in that case when there were five murders and probably the most intense publicity. There was no gag order in the Casey Anthony case, your honor. I think that if you adopt what Mr. Delaranda says, when television was invented in 1947, he could have said, well, this is a medium that can affect everything differently than the radio. I think we have to live with the medium we're given. And unless your honor can look at one of those statements from an evidentiary perspective that Mr. Romero said and say, that's the statement. That's the statement that's going to adversely affect. And if we look at the history of cases where there was outrageous behavior that affected trials, I don't think any of the statements come close to the sort of prejudicial statement that, in fact, today, if you look at what Mr. Romero said in this courtroom about the conduct of the state, I think those are far more prejudicial in an open courtroom than any of the things he said on the Internet. Your honor has at your disposal an enormous arsenal of tools to protect the process. You can have more jurors come in. You can do individualized voir dire. You can sequester the jury. There are hundreds of high publicity cases when that happened. I mean, the verdict in the Casey Anthony case, the verdict in the Danny Rawling case, where the Florida Supreme Court looked at that and said, Mr. Rawling, even with the intense publicity there, received a fair trial. Your honor can accomplish that. It may be more difficult, but I think our system deserves that sort of scrutiny. And to think of going to limit anyone's speech in a circumstance like this, where there's a national debate on the stand your ground. It's not just this case. There's a national debate, and we live in a place where the marketplace of ideas and the importance of the First Amendment is essential. Thank you, your honor. Thank you very much. Do you have a response? Very briefly, your honor. I know the court's... Now, Mr. Ponce and Mr. Thomas promised me that theirs would be brief, and they were. Mine will be very brief. In response to defense or counsel for the media talking about the Casey Anthony, I believe Judge Perry did hold Mr. Baez in contempt. I don't know if it was an outright gag order, but I believe he was held in contempt. But I think the record will speak for itself. 
The bottom line, Your Honor, is there's been mention of 72% uh, poll. I'm not aware of that poll. Maybe it exists, uh, but I haven't seen it in terms of feeling the defendant is guilty. And uh, Mr. Crump, I'm sorry, Mr. O'Mara said that uh, Mr. Crump worked for the state. He's not working for us. He's working for I the big. I didn't get that that's what he said. I, I believe he, I think he said he was a surrogate of the state, and he's not. He's not. It's just like they distance themselves from the defendant's brother, who they said, we don't have anything to do with him. He's doing whatever he wants on his own. Mr. O'Mara is the same. Um, Mr. Crump is the same term. Now, finally, regarding political influence, the record would speak for itself in terms of when we got this case and what we did or we didn't do. Uh, but Mr. O'Mara keeps throwing out uh, Sanford Police felt this or Sanford Police felt that. Sanford Police submitted the case to the State Attorney's Office. The State Attorney's Office was still investigating the case. When we got involved in the case, we still completely investigated and it was stuff that came after all that. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to reserve my ruling on this and I hope to have a decision made and an order rendered on Monday. So um, 